picture within which we're moving is this basic idea of the social context of health, right? the social determinants of health, that there's a, a, a big difference between a biological model of health and a basic sort of understanding of how health disparities are distributed across the population. And this has really gained the attention of people at the CDC and people at NIH, and they've developed different kinds of models about how individuals are embedded within different social systems and how those different um, uh, embeddings can create different outcomes for health. And these outcomes are often non-trivial. And so if you were to, there's a, a couple of nice review papers that have tried to parse out the, the sort of features that lead to the determinants of health and what parts of these are behavioral, which parts of these are medical, which parts of these deal with genetics or environment and so forth. And often behavioral aspects that lead to um, health outcomes can account for as much as half of the um, disparities we see in health. And so um, as Chris Backrack used to put it to his head of NICHD, um, all they, everybody wants to put their money into curing um, a disease, um, but in fact, you know, we've not actually cured many diseases yet. Um, and we have, a lot of, we have a lot of variants we can play with on the social determinants of health side. And the social network tradition, of course, fits squarely into this idea of the social determinants of health. And what's interesting about the social determinants of health from a network standpoint is a point that um, uh, Nicholas Christakis makes quite clearly, which is that most of the time when we invest our time, energy, and money into an individual model of, of patients through the doctors and their healthcare outcomes, we think of that output as at the patient level and as at the individual level. But often because these network effects don't occur just through the helps of through, um, the, patients occur, the, the, the patient's effects on themselves, but there are these social contexts and spillover effects. So it's not that, that, my, that we just have health behaviors that affect each other, but the good things we do in terms of investing in patients also spill over to patients' context. So it's not just that I learn how to smoke by being tied to my friends, but I learn how to exercise, and I learn how to eat better, and the rest of these kinds of things. So these collateral outcomes can be quite dramatic, and James Fowler has some really nice experimental evidence using Facebook data, where very small change effects that appear small at the individual level, once you multiply them through by the number of friends people have, can actually have quite dramatic outcomes. And so these are all ways and, and ideas that have been hinting at why we might care about thinking about networks of health. And of course, as this is the same slide I showed you the first day, this has been picked up by researchers in the field. We actually have, are seeing more and more people spending time, energy, and money to think about how we study networks and health. And so what I wanted to do now was give you a history of where that, these ideas have come from and where we might take them in the future. So what I'm going to do first is just give you a, um, uh, an overview of what I see as the key historical elements of, of, of this field and how it's developed over the last 40 years. Now, this is an idiosyncratic list necessarily, right? Um, I think most of these are some of the highlights, but um, we could quibble over them. And I think it might be kind of fun as a collective over the next few years to say, you know, you forgot this paper. We ought to create a, a resource for this. Um, and similarly, when I talk about what the open questions are in this field, those are decidedly idiosyncratic and um, open to debate and ideas, and I think it'd be fun to play with. I like to break the field into three periods. There's an old period that started in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, and this was Moreno and the development of social network analysis. I'm not going to talk much about that. It was a very slow climb for a while. There was a middle period um, uh, between the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, um, uh, where we got some really nice pieces that came out. It was the development, the institutionalization of the field and some of the old heads that we're used to. And then there's the modern era, where things have really just taken off and skyrocketed in terms of their outcome. And so I'm going to talk a bit through some of these pieces, not all of them, um, about what I see as sort of the key elements. Um, one of the early elements um, uh, that, has, that has, has driven a lot of work, especially amongst adolescents um, uh, and the social support literature, is this great book by Morris Rosenberg that came out called Society and the Adolescent Self-Image. And what was interesting about this piece is this is one of the first pieces that talked about the concept of self-esteem not just as a psychological process, but as a process that's a reflection of the, of the social environment that people are embedded in. And this book really caused a storm. It won the, a, the AAAS Award for Best Social Psychological Book of the Year, um, and the review in science done by a sociologist eviscerated it, right? And so this is a book that, on the one hand, people were giving awards to and they thought it was fantastic. On the other hand, people thought it was the worst possible sort of model for a psychological thing that could happen. And it was just huge tension in the field 
because it took this really complex idea about what was going on inside people's heads and attributed a lot of that to what's going on in the environment around them. And this was actually a pretty crazy idea at the time, at least amongst people dealing with adolescence and this notion of a self-image. But it was such a captivating idea that people are not just engaged in what they're doing individually in their own heads in sort of a Freudian or Jungian sort of matter that was, that was going on at the time, but instead they were reflection of the people they're engaged in. And this opened the door for thinking about how you might open society and think about the way you're dealing with people in order to manipulate this kind of self-image. And it, it, it generated a host of studies about thinking about this process. At the same time, Everett Rogers, Diffusion of Innovation, the first edition of this book, I couldn't find an image of the first edition, this is the, the third edition cover, um, was published. And this book has become the, um, the gold standard for thinking about network diffusions and the network diffusion of health. And many of his examples were, were, were health examples, um, but it's really a case of opening a question in a way that has sparked lots of, of, new, um, uh, of new answers. And this book is, is, is in its now, it's in its fifth edition and is, has gone on um, uh, you know, to inform just the, the field um, entirely. Probably the next big thing, there's a bunch of, of methodological things that happened um, uh, in the early 70s, but from a health standpoint, the, the person who really rang the bell that we're still hearing reverberate is um, uh, Denise Kendall's work on homophily selection and socialization that came out in 19, about, about 1978 or 79. This was the first piece that really hammered home this notion that um, the association between network alters is not causal. There, there is this mixture model going on under the hood between selection and influence, and most of our models have severely overestimated the peer effects. This is, what, this is the, sort of the take home piece from this paper. And this was a shot across the bow for networks folks. Prior to this, the, the, a lot of the work that was being done was entirely generated by, by respondents saying what their friends had done. So you would ask a kid, do you smoke? They would say yes. Do your friends smoke? They'd say, of course my friends smoke. And the overestimation at that level turned out to be quite dramatic. And not only that, of course, then the, pe the friends people were hanging out with were selected by all the selection features that David was so nice pointing to um, earlier this set. And so this has been a problem that's been around a long time. And so what's nice is that we've actually now have a chance to think about some of the solutions. And so this is what makes the Siena work so nice. The other piece. If anybody has done any work in the social support literature and understanding the social relations and embeddedness in health literature, you run into Lisa Berkman and Leonard um, Stey's work. This piece, especially this original piece on the Alameda County nine-year follow-up, was really looking at how social relations and having peers and contacts affected disease transmission and disease resilience. And it was one of the first pieces to show that after a long-term prospective study following people for nine years, you can show that those who are more deeply engaged in the social context did better. Now, she's been continuing this line of work for a long time, and so including a very recent piece that's been picked up a lot, the social integration work, which is really sort of focusing not just on having relations, but how those relations are redundant and built into a community setting. In the 80s, um, uh, the, uh, there was a resurgence in work and interest on sexual networks. And this is the part that might be a little idiosyncratic because this is kind of the world that I've been playing with and, and sort of where I cut my teeth. But um, Richard Rothenberg um, uh, and James Potteret, um, uh, or John Potteret, excuse me, um, really engaged in a series of landmark studies to understand and identify sexually transmitted disease context amongst um, essentially the downtrodden urban poor. And there was a, a, a a, a, a world that had been dominated by contact tracing in the CDC without a theoretical sort of lens to try to make sense of why these relationships formed or what they might mean for the long-term transmission of disease. And at the same time, of course, HIV was taking off, and this was a, a really frightening time to be an epidemiologist um, in, in, in the early 80s. And um, what Rothenberg and Potter did better than anyone else is they collected data. <laughs> and they collected data that was really, really difficult to collect. And, and they did this by building relationships of trust amongst people who wouldn't normally talk to CDC. And they collected the Project 90 data, which many of us have used and played with, but also lots of other different studies. Um, and this has gone on for a long time. And if you ever want to just like, have a kick in the pants book to read, this is John Potter, it's an autobiography which is um, Seeking the Positives, and this is um, a really nice social history of spending time and, and what it really took to do this work. And you get an appreciation for any of us that try, try to do a survey and get a bad response rate and realize that both the quality and quantity of data they were able to collect, it's really remarkable. And this is how he did it. He did it by building these kinds of relationships. And so it's, it's really a, a great piece. 
Um, the other piece now that has had a, 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 a dramatic effect in the world is James House's work on my, with colleagues on social relationships and health. This is an overview piece that took some of the earlier work where Berkman and all had done and combined it with a bunch of other studies to give you a sort of an overview meta-analysis or review piece that made so clear that, this, that there's a, a strong standing across lots of settings, a historical um, and historically consistent effect of social relationships and health. Bernice Prisca Salito's first work on mental health took off about now. So this is in the early 90s. Um, she had this really nice piece trying to come up with a theoretical model built on Durkheim and social integration. Right? And this work now has ex extended a lot across a, a wide set of pieces. Most of this work, what's nice about Bernice is that she um, has, a, has a, a unique way of, of building this intersection between an institutional context, like a mental hospital or a community, and the individual relational context as measured through ego networks. And she's one of the first people to spend a really nice time taking this epidemiological model and applying it to mental health. And so the opening up the store of the mental health world was really um, uh, something that hadn't been done in the, in the sort of sociolo sociological social networks tradition before um, Bernice stepped into the gate. In the early 90s, Martina Morris started doing work on, on epidemic modeling. Um, her first work was, was looking at mixing patterns. This is what's driven most of the work we've seen now on things like assorted of mating and such. Um, but in addition, she introduced this idea in about 1993, this idea of concurrency. And this was an idea that had been completely ignored and, and not thought of prior to this work. And it, it has since become one of the key elements that's driving our understanding of disease transmission differences across settings, where you find very similar safe places in terms of number of partners, but very different um, uh, populations in terms of the number of overlapping relationships. And those overlapping relations have created this set. For those of us that are looking forward into the future, one of the nice things about the concurrent partnership piece that I, that I really don't think even Martina understood at the time when she did it, is that it opened this door about thinking about population level, level network effects that are distinguishable from individual level network effects. Many people still confuse the idea that concurrency is an individual risk factor. It's not. And concurrency has, has literally has no effect on the individual above the number of partners but it has a huge effect on the population, or a potential effect on the population. And that distinction between an emergent property of a network and an individual local property is fundamental to the network understanding that what we really care about is how the emergent properties of these structures create risks that wouldn't otherwise be there. Um, but it really only became clear with, the, with something as, as nice as the concurrency example. And that work's gone on um, for quite some time. Um, this work had been complemented with an entirely, with a really fundamental set of work in mathematical modeling. And May and Anderson um, is, are the, um, uh, the prime, anybody who's the epidemiologist in this room, room might shiver a little bit when they see this book. Because it's the, it is the like, you know, it's the book you've got to slog through on the mathematics side like, to get your epidemiology degree. But it, they really have, they were the early developers of compartmental models and differential equation models for, ge for generating um, uh, these kinds of things and provide a very nice um, complement to the um, uh, otherwise uh, sort of discrete models that are coming out of networks. Then you move into the adolescent world. And um, this is the, the precursors to the ad health idea. There was a, a, a series of work coming out of Kendall and then her students. Um, but uh, Su Susan Ennett and Carl Bauman at UNC um, did a series of just landmark studies where they followed kids very carefully over time to look at um, peer influences on smoking and smoking behavior. And this is, uh, and other drug behaviors, and Susan continues um, uh, this work, and it really is, um, uh, you said, sort of say, again, set the stage for the, a lot of the work that's happening at Health and why we might continue doing this work. Um, about this time, a, uh, uh, prior to this piece, to the Provon and Millward piece, um, Provon and Millward, excuse me, piece, um, most of the work done in social networks and health had been done at the individual level, thinking about disease or thinking about social influence. What Pravon and um, uh, Milward did is they opened the door to think about interorganizational networks and health. And they, spent a, they, they did this remarkable study of four or five different counties and the, and the health organization relationships amongst pro health providers in those counties to say, what is it about the way organi healthcare provision organizations are interacting that makes some counties more healthy than others? And it's, it's one of these studies, the, the paper is like 80 pages long. It's this really in-depth, beautiful study of going through each of these counties and asking what is it about social integration and, and essentially collective efficacy amongst the at the organizational level that makes some organizational fields more productive for producing health than others. And it has set the tone for how we think about organizational studies in health ever since. 
Then about this time, you know, sort of the floodgates open. And so I'm really just picking the highlights. Um, uh, network models of diffusion um, is Tom Valente's um, modern answer to Rogers, ever, Rogers' diffusion innovations. He puts a discrete network model on top of it. And this has become the guiding work for doing social interventions in um, networks and health um, ever since. And Tom has um, become one of the largest champions in the modern era thinking about how we actually get in the field and help people intervene with respect to um, uh, networks and health. Ad Health was first released then in about 1996 or 97. The data were made public. This, of course, is the, uh, the data set we've all been talking about and working with since. It is probably the landmark network and health study of our era. It's a 129 unique network context to allow us to ask how kids' embeddedness in social settings, their relationships with their parents, their relationships with their siblings, their other sort of social contexts, create a context where health could um, either be promoted or not. And we've not seen anything like it since. And, if, and just to preview what I think the problem is in the open going forward, is that we need a new ad health. Right, we need an ad health that's actually accurate for the world we live in today. But this is, this is shown what's possible when the public health community can coalesce around an idea that is as important as understanding the social and contextual features of health, it generates a study that has, by all, by all measures, been just remarkably um, successful. Along the same lines, we have car the, this is sort of a combination of um, the work that came out of Valente's work earlier and Rogers before that. Carl Latkin has um, developed a series of, of, of studies that look at the interaction, or the, excuse me, the intervention um, uh, through peers. So instead of thinking of just the descriptive side of networks, what do we do in terms of identifying an association between one peer and the next, what Latkin has done is he's really focused on identifying the peer leaders and how we might manipulate those leaders to do something in the network. So we, it's He's sort of the, I don't think, I think he would hate this, but he's the equivalent of the, of the Marxist phrase, right? The, 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 the key is not to understand the world, but to change the world. Well, that's the idea, is that we would identify these peer leaders, we could do something with them, and make the place of the world a healthier place. Um, in the mid-2000s, StatNet was developed, right? So I'm skipping over a few things, um, but this is a, uh, has been a, a game changer in terms of the ability to model networks, right? As opposed to just describe them. The Chains of Affection paper, um, that I have some connection to, came out um, uh, about this time and sort of helped people think about sexual relations amongst adolescents, which hadn't been done before and was a direct result of the, ad, uh, the opportunities made um, uh, possible by Ad Health and um, the work that Martine and others had done before that. Um, we also opened a series of questions about race disparities in health in general, but in uh, relations in particular, turns out there's some remarkably interesting mathematical constraints on the racial disparities in um, sexually transmitted diseases that are generated by the network constraints of homophily through, through um, relations. And so this opened up a series of problems. And into this breach, for the last 30 years of work that's been done, Christakis's paper pops up. Right? So this is in 2007. Um, he publishes a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine on the spread of obesity in um, a large-scale network over 32 years. And this just created a firestorm, right? This both simultaneously reignited the field and saying, well, we sh we've got to be doing this work. It's so powerful. Something as individually crazy as obesity might be affected by who our friends are. And at the same time, drove the economists absolutely nuts that this couldn't possibly be true. And so the very debate about this is, is, part, is part of what dri has driven the field is probably as much as anything else. And um, of course, um, uh, there, there's a... Uh, uh, a new event that occurred in the early 2000s, right, which is this development of online networks. And one of the first papers to link it to health is this work by Ellison and colleagues, which has become a, a sort of a minor citation classic within this subfield of understanding onla online networks and health. And the work here um, uh, is, is really, I think, I think this piece is more about opening the door and saying this is time to ask these questions, what, what, what is going on um, uh, within these relations that we hadn't had any chance to study before. And finally, of course, the, any talk like this would be impossible without, again, recognizing the only real textbook in the field, um, uh, which is um, uh, Tom Valente's piece, which if you haven't, if this book isn't on your shelf and well-worn, go out and buy it and read it twice. Um, so that takes us to about 2010. Um, this is what the curve of publications looks like in this field right now, right? So 2010 is right here. Right? Any of you that have like, looked at a runtime curve, right? this would scare the hell out of you. right? But this is actually the opportunity that you're stepping into, is that we've gone through a field that has sort of puttered along for quite some time, had a little blip of growth in the 1990s and 2000s, and has since just rocketed off the scale. 
And so what we're living in right now is, is a current sort of a, a space where we understand that the social determinants of health matter, and we understand that a key element of the social determinants of health are social networks. And making sense of how we play with this field and understand it is what is, what is a challenge coming to us the next. And so I had set myself the challenge um, uh, of figuring out how could I summarize the 18,000 papers that have been published since 2000. Um, and instead of reading you the titles of each one, I thought I would do what um, uh, Peter Mooka always accuses me of doing, which I'm going to turn it into a network, right? <laughs> Um, so the way we do this is, for those of you who want a, a quick crash course in bibliometrics, is we take each paper, this is the paper called An Analysis of Human Popular Lomavirus Vaccine Debate on MySpace Blogs, uh, a classic if you haven't read it, um, and we connect that paper to other papers if it shares lots of words, right? So we use a cosine similarity score to say how similar this paper is to others. And so this paper is somewhat similar to a series of other papers about HPV, some other papers about smoking, and it's talking about smoking on blogs, a set of papers about the environment. And if you go through and take all papers and do this with all other papers, you generate a network, right? And so this paper actually sits at the intersection of five different clusters, one on blog, one on HPV, another about social influences on health, and so forth. And we can imagine doing this now, not for just 100 papers, but for all papers, that's too big. So we just to remind you, we throw some contours over it instead. And you get something that looks like this. Right? So this is the landscape of social networks and health research. And it's kind of a nice little continent. On the one hand, there's this giant clust mountain over here on social support and aging. This is the, as you're going to see more in a bit, um, this is the world that's talking about things that have to do with social support, which is the first pre pre predecessor of works we're working on. Um, HIV is another piece. If you want sort of the overall set, the difference between the left, the left side of this and the right side of this tends to be a micro versions. This is about people. This is about health systems. This tends to be the world where medical things happen, so actual like, biology stuff happens up here. And, and the main concerns tend to be about cancer and other sorts of trials and other um, explicit disease foci. Um, there's a, a group of um, pieces, of course, done on the HIV world down at the bottom, and a link between the social support world and the social capital world. And smack in the middle is a bunch of the new stuff that's occurring on social media, which is drawing on lots of these different pieces in this new context. Just to make it clear for you, the example paper I just gave sits about there, right? Now this, what looks like a field, actually, is a bunch of clusters, right? So in each of these settings, we provided a little community detection algorithm that we have through, we went through, and identified the most cohesive clusters in this set. And I thought, thought I might talk about some of the trends in a couple of them. Um, and, but that they're, they're essentially the clusters are what determined the, um, the labels you're seeing here. So first, let's think a little bit about trends in each of these subfields. So the um, health policy systems and the social support and aging are the two big giants in the field. They've been working, they've been around the longest and have been going pretty strong. The health policy systems literature has been pretty constant over this entire period. The social support and aging literature has kind of decreased, right? So it's still a big deal, but compared to what it was, we're doing proportionally less of this. I think this is less a feature of people no longer doing this work than it is a feature of people doing a lot more of the other work that's sort of growing up over time. The HIV world has always been a, a, a fairly small but consistent set of research, um, and the big growth has been occurring in the social media world. Right. Everything else tends to be a, a, a small player in the big picture of this relatively large field. Now, just to be fair, there are 150 different clusters, so it's hard for any cluster to be a big chunk. And when you're 10% out of, well, out of all the rest of them, that is a big chunk. Right. So we can think a little bit about how this space might be organized. Right? So this is the effect of Rogers' diffusions of innovation. Right? So these are the papers in this space that cite Rogers' paper. Um, so it, I don't think it's um, probably fair to say he's had an impact on the field. Um, Wasserman and Faust can similarly be happy, right? So those of you that don't have a Wasserman and Faust book should buy that. Um, uh, maybe not read that quite as often, but at least have it on your shelf to reference. Um, uh, they keep, Was, Stanley keeps telling me they're going to put a new version of this book out, but he hasn't done it yet, um, which is probably okay because it's already like 900 pages, so the new version will probably be 1,800. Um, so there's that. Um, Tom Valente, right, so his work has been, of course, remarkably um, uh, important across the field. Interestingly, more, less so in the applied medical side, and he's now currently in medical school, so I'm sort of expecting this side of the world to pick up a bit more. Um, 
This is Christakis and Fowler, right? So what's most amazing about their impact in the field is this paper was published in 2007, right? So the, of, all, of all papers that were published since 2010, right, these, these things haven't had a whole lot of time to make an effect, but almost everybody cites them. And so these are the big players in the field. We know them. They're all over the place. On the other hand, some pieces are a little more idiosyncratic. So this is Martina Morris's work on concurrency. As you might expect, it's most of its activity is going on down here in the understanding of um, HIV, as does the um, RDS work. So RDS is, is really primarily going on right now in the, in, is being driven by trying to find hard to reach populations. And the reason we care about hard to reach populations is really bloodborne infections of which HIV is, is one of the main sets. On the other hand, um, uh, this is James House social relations piece. So the people that are working on social support and aging are citing James House. Now my question might be, right, can the folks over here learn anything from this set? Right? So we, we have some parts of the field where we understand what's occurring and we use it um, to quite nice effect. And my guess is that it might be nice to find that on the other side. Similarly, those over in the um, organizational side of the world who have been working with Pravon and Millward would likely um, do nice to sort of take some of the insights about social integration in health systems and apply it to sort of health systems and networks more generally. Um, this is the impact of ad health. So ad health started entirely over here in the adolescent world, but has since, now that they, we have both parent surveys and work coming through um, uh, as these folks get older, into the social support, social capital, and HIV world. There's a little bit of stuff going on in the health systems world, um, but that world is, is largely being driven by um, uh, some of the um, uh, things about school systems and school supports is going on in that work. Um, the new kid on the block, right, um, uh, is the Facebook work. Um, this is, I think, just ripe to be done. What we have right now are a small number of highly cited papers, so that's what the size of these, each of these circles is how often that paper's been cited in itself. And so I think there's um, a lot of work to be done on uh, uh, online networks and understanding that, um, but currently it hasn't had, it's had a pretty localized effect. Um, some people have had very disparate careers and thus very disparate effects. Someone like Edward Lauman, right, started out working in economic sociology and organizational networks. And so he had a huge effect in understanding the ways in which we think about the health delivery policy. He then moved and founded and became one of the co-founders of the um, National Health and Social Retirement, NS, I can't ever say that, NSHP? NSHP, thank you, which is a study of aged, um, uh, of older adults, right? And so the work came out there, but interestingly, older adults and STDs, right? And so he's bridged both of these worlds in an interesting way, and so a lot of his work um, uh, has sort of been spread across these different pockets. Um, Bernice Pesca Salido's work has, 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 is probably the only sociologist that has so, so far really jumped into the applied actual medical side of this literature, right? So she's had, of course, most of her work in the ego network and social capital kind of setting, building on that, of those institutional features, um, but she's also had an impact in the um, uh, mental health world and the medical um, side of sociology in ways that many of us haven't. Um, we can stop talking about people and start talking about topics. So these are papers that ask about race or race disparities. And so race and race disparities have been covered a good deal across most of the population, right? but not nearly as much as gender. Right? And so gender and gender disparities, or the ways in which gender plays across um, uh, the health delivery um, uh, has been largely, um, uh, you know, has been widely studied. Interestingly, not so much at the health systems policy level. Maybe that's because organizations need not be thought about, but my guess is it's just been ignored. Um, so there might be an opportunity. We can also compare and contrast different ways in which someone might um, uh, uh, approach the questions about networks and health. And so here are things that we would think would be connected, your BMI, your diabetes, or your hypertension. And it turns out that the social scientists um, uh, have been focusing largely on BMI, whereas the medical and um, health folks have been focusing on di diabetes and um, hypertension. And one might wonder if it's worth um, these guys having a conversation. Right? So this is just a way of trying to orient you to the field and the diversity of this field. It's nuts, right? There are so many things that we can study and think about, and it's so diverse that you're jumping into a community now, a community of scholars, where your opportunity is to carve out your little mountain that you can do something with and make a stand. And I think that what's nice is that this work is there, but it's growing rapidly. So if you can find a niche to fill, that's going to be useful. 
So I'm going to switch gears a little bit then and ask, what should we be doing next? Right? Where should the field go if the, if, the, if the task is to think a little bit about where we can really push social networks in terms of the social network side of networks and health? And I'm going to be honest with you here, um, I'm going to focus more on the network side than the health side um, because I think that a lot of the dependent variables are pretty clear. It's this notion of independent variables that I care to. One thing I'm also going to point out is that this list has changed dramatically in 10 years. If I were giving, like, what should we be focusing on in 10 years ago, it would have been missing data and networks, it would have been network dynamics, it would have been selection and influence, it would have been statistical models and networks, all of which are still open problems to some degree, but they're problems worth solving. And I have no doubt are going to be solved in the next five to 10 years. If they were going to go from the Siena models, the instrumental variable models, the rest of these sorts of models are moving along at a rapid clip, at a diverse clip. And what's going to, the real pain over the next 10 years in the statistical modeling framework is going to be winnowing out the winners from the losers. And I think that process is occurring. Um, but I'm not, I'm not concerned from a scientific standpoint of us getting to that answer. I, I suspect that's on its way. On the other hand, some of these other questions I don't think people are really focusing on as much. And again, this is the idiosyncratic part of being the last speaker. I can talk about the things I like. So that's what you're going to get. Um, so I'm going to revisit this idea of dynamic diffusion that um, Amali pointed out, um, uh, on, on, or Jake, excuse me, pointed out um, uh, in the diffusion slide, that if you have time relations, the, the set of paths over which a diffusion can, can pass are changed dramatically. And just to give you an idea of this, of course, the Ad Health Network, if this were treated as if it were all at some one time, everyone could reach everyone else. But once you respect time, it turns out only, out only about 40% of the possible linkages that could be made are actually made. Because the timing breaks this network, this is the picture of the exposure graph, it breaks this network into little tiny chunks around concurrent edges. So that part we know. We know that part well. We've done the work required to figure out that, that how the concurrency promotes um, a diffusion. And we understand how the ordering of ties um, constrains diffusion. We've done a little bit on understanding how that interacts with structure. So right now what's occurred is we have two paths of ways of thinking about disease diffusion. One is a dynamic set coming out of epidemiology and the timing problem. And then we have a structure feature that's dealing with reach and distance and all the sort of structural properties we talked about in the first couple of days. And the intersection of those two has, is rel relatively unexplored. So for example, it turns out that timing matters a lot if you have a very sparse, fragile network. Timing matters almost not at all if you have a really robust structure. So that interaction is, is, is consistent only within a very clear, we only know that, that this answer is true within a single simulation. So we don't, the, the generalizability of this finding is completely unknown. Moreover, we know nothing about the ways in which the population turnover of a setting and the timing of ties at the population level would lead to the risk of a, of a sustained epidemic in one setting or the other. Right, what we know now is what occurs in a closed population over a fixed window of time, but this idea of an open population with an ongoing steady state is unknown. And so there's a great deal of mathematical work left to be done on that. I was sort of hoping Peter would be here. Um, the second problem, which I think that despite the years of work we've spent on it, is this community detection problem. And this community detection problem is really a problem about trying to figure out how we slice a continuum into chunks. And what we've done now is we've, we've generated a huge number of, of tools to identify which uh, an optimal assortment of, net, of, of nodes to, to networks. But each of these solutions are a little bit different. So any of you who spend any bit of time playing with community detection, it can be incredibly frustrating to figure out whether or not I have six communities or five communities or 14 communities. My joke has become that community detection is the Afghanistan of network analysis. It seems like a good idea to get in when you start, but it's really hard to get out. You're not sure what you've accomplished when you're done, right? Um, and this is a problem, particularly, I, I, this is a, a hard enough problem on a static network. It's an exceedingly difficult problem on a dynamic network. When your question is not just what's occurring at any given time slice, but how these slices evolve over time. And so I really encourage people to look forward and think about this. My suggestion, or my hint, and then Jake and I are working on a paper on this right now, is that the problem is, is misspecified. That we think about clusters as if they're one thing, where, clusters, where communities are, in fact, two things simultaneously. They're the maintenance of a boundary. They're, that is an us versus a them. And they're the maintenance of an internal cohesion. And really, groups only, communities as such, only exist when both of these conditions are met. And we should be measuring those features directly, as opposed to trying to come up with this intersection on its own. But we don't have a way of doing that yet, and certainly no way of doing it algorithmically. Um, 
The third sort of method speech that I would love to see people more work on, and my students are all laughing at me now, um, uh, is this idea of thinking about building up from micro-mechanisms to macro-mechanisms. And I always give the triad census as the periodic table of social elements. This is the thing that captures sociality, and if we can understand distributions at this level, aggregated up smartly, we can understand micro macro features. And so as Molly pointed out quite nicely, these 16 triads discover, capture a social process. So if I think that a friend of a friend is a friend, that I should see more of those triads. If my enemy's enemy is somebody I avoid, I should see very few of these triads, right? So the beauty about a triad model is it's easy to think in terms of three. I can think about my partner's partner being a rival, right? Or uh, my enemy's enemy being my friend. It's really hard to think about a network of 100,000 people and how they're connecting and what the different social roles might be. Moreover, if you know the network distribution of triads, Right? That's constrained because every network has some distribution. There is a mapping from this topology to this distribution. And in some cases, that mapping is exact. Right? And we know what it should be. And what I would like to see us do is make that mapping more explicit. Right? Now what we have is a very crude way of getting from presence or absence, all complete triads or not, to some very crude approximation of what the global structure is. Or we can simulate it by sort of specifying an ergon model and, and trying to sample from the space. But what we should be able to do is map from the exact distribution, the, the cardinal numbers here, to, a, to a, a range of possible solutions, which I think will simultaneously make our statistical models more exact. From the theory standpoint, I, you'll notice that I can't help myself. It's a three by three by three here, for those of you that are counting. Um, uh, I've, I've, this, is the, this is sort of sociological degeneracy to play on the name from yesterday, is that I can't help myself from going in that direction. Um, so you saw this graph, right? So this, I, I think that the, the most undertapped theoretical part of networks left right now is understanding role systems. And this is because we've moved from a, a really hard in the last 20 years on trying to model connectionist features of the network. So why one person is connected to the next, what forms an edge between this pair versus that pair, and we've spent comparatively little time thinking about how relations are connected to each other. So how does romantic ties correspond to bickering, right? Ideally, it's not the same diet, but it often is, right? And so the idea is that, there, that a role system implies a logic of relations. That, that it means something to say that a friend of a friend is a friend, that means that those relations are, in fact, equivalent. A friend of a friend is a friend, whereas a romantic partner relation is not equivalent. My romantic partner's partner is not my partner, right? That's my enemy. And so understanding, right, or my ignorance, depending on the case, right? And so the thinking is that there's, we know this intuitively, and it's a deep part of what it means to be a social critter, that we can go around and walk into a room and know the distinction between what it means to raise your hand or sit down or behave or what have you, and that's captured by the interactions and obligations we have to each other, and those are the things that we haven't done hardly anything with. The good news is, is I think that the bridge between most network models we're doing now and this way of thinking can be found in the social support literature. Like all of that is there, right? Is there in piecemeal thinking about what it means to be a dying spouse or to have a, a support system or not. And so the idea, especially connected to health, is built into that setting, but we haven't exploited it and we certainly haven't expanded it beyond the local diet. And I think the reason we might want to do so is we're getting the kind of data now that makes this possible. So this is an example from a single village that um, uh, Manaj Monahan has collected here. Um, uh, this is collected in India. And they collected, for every household in, the, in 80 villages across a bunch of different states in India, they collected data on who you hang out with, who you talk to about health matters, who you go to for financial help. And it looks like a mess until you simplify it. Right? So the notion of a block model lets you see that there are certain classes of folks that are left to themselves, other classes of folks which provide a financial bridge, and other classes of folks that provide a health or communication bridge. And understanding what correspondence to being in either of these classes should be informative of understanding role systems in a way that we can intervene on and think about, but we haven't done that yet. The last theory thing um, uh, that I would like to spend a little bit of time with, which is related to this notion of knowers, is to actually think about the life history of roles. We're pretty good, or we're getting better, at the dynamics of, of connectionist networks. So how one node changes and becomes another. But we ought to expect relations to age in a certain way. Right? The relationship between a parent and a four-year-old had hopefully been better than a different, different than, a parent, than a parent and a 14-year-old, a 24-year-old, or a 54-year-old. Right? That relationship 
evolves naturally. And understanding that evolution of that relationship is something that we could think of both in terms, in terms of small scales, like in a year in a classroom, or long scale over the life course. But understanding a life's course of relationality has not been done. And finally, of course, we need to understand more clearly what the health mechanism is. What is it that gets a social relation under the skin? The, the, the fight over the Christakis paper was just this, right? It was, the hard part was the set of mechanisms we have in hand to distinguish why my friends might make me fat, right, is because we have to figure out what it is. Like, they're not putting food in my face, they're not stopping from exercise, what's going on? Is it information? Is it uh, selection or so forth? And our understanding of what that actual mechanism is, we've yet to really fully, oh, I think, flesh out. Um, uh, Nick Christakis does a very nice job in his annual review place of outlining six different mechanisms that he, he thinks are going on, none of which are new and unique to any of us, right? So they're, they're all the, they're the standards. It's selection, it's information, it's peer pressure, these types of things. I suspect there's a lot more going on there, else the social support literature wouldn't be nearly as robust as it is. And so I think it's worth spending some time on there. Finally, a handful of data pieces that I would love to spend, a, see, spend more time on. I want to see a return to community studies. Right? One of the nice things about um, networks is that we take a social context as a cohesive whole. We understand that social context as a place where relationships are embedded and have histories and have meanings for the participants in that setting, which is decidedly opposite of the idea of a national representative sample. Right? And so what we did in the 1940s and 50s with sample survey methodology was generate this wonderfully powerful tool where for a small amount of money, I could sample a small number of people and draw perfectly valid inferences to the entire population. It's like friggin' magic to be able to do that, right? And it's, it, and it's really made it beautiful to do standard kinds of social science. But what we gave up was the community structure. We gave up this idea to be able to think about what it means to live on that side of the tracks versus this side of the tracks. And we've tried to sneak it back in with neighborhood studies. We've tried to sneak it back in with SES and so forth. But I don't think we've actually done it because the, the real beauty of community studies was an institutional embeddedness of relations. It is not just that I lived in this neighborhood, but I worked at this factory, I, I, I attended this church, and my grandmother lived six blocks down. And it's that kind of relational integration that we don't really have any sense for. And so I think now we have the national representative sample sort of business well attended to. We understand how to do it. We've got good um, pieces in place. And so I think we can now go back and embed community studies in that kind of context and learn a great deal. Um, I come from the Northwest. Um, we're used to putting um, uh, collars around wolves and such. Um, I think it's time to start to think about how we might collar people, right? Um, not literally, of course. Um, IRB doesn't, doesn't like that, though. Um, those, those of you uh, um, uh, from around this world might talk to James Kitts, who actually made um, a bunch of graduate students wear the equivalent of collars um, to look at their interactions. But we have digital traces, right? We're, people voluntarily wear collars now all the time. And so figuring out how we can ethically move from those digital breadcrumbs that are being left around us to the social networks that they're, they're clearly leaving traces for is, I think, the next challenge for, for um, electronic data collection. And the beauty of it is the data is there, right? And on the one hand, private companies are already doing this. So Facebook has this data. Citibank has this data. Like anybody who's ever ran a credit card has left this breadcrumb around. But we as the social science and research community don't have access to it. So finding a way that we can use that data that people are freely given up right, in a way that's ethically responsible, provides for the safety of respondents, and contributes to the global health of people who are engaged in this activity, I think, is a wonderful task that is before you guys, right, who have the opportunity to do this over the next few years. Now I'm going to contradict myself 180 degrees, and I'm going to go from the community studies to say we need a national sample of networks. <laughs> that is, we need a smart way of doing a national sample of networks. And this I've stolen shamelessly from, uh, this is not my, well, I had this idea too, but um, this is not just my idea. I stole this, this, this figure directly from uh, uh, Nicholas Christakis. But what we've typically done now with ego network surveys, which are brilliant and efficient and a great way to collect data for a, a huge number of questions, is we've done it by just taking out a one-step e ego network sample, or, and usually a self-reported um, one-step ego network sample. And what that allows us to do is look at things like mixing and the extent to which there's segregation in the network and so forth, some role relation features. But if we could go out two steps, right, then we get closed triangles, 
we get reciprocity, we get popularity, we get lots of things that structure the global network in a way that should allow us to describe global network properties in a very efficient way. And so to be able to impanel, imagine, that, imagine what we could do if we were to take the kids of ad health, all the parents of ad health that now have kids, we go out, we sample those kids and go out two steps to all their friends, right? That would be a design that would now give us a, a, a beautiful sample of networks of networks spread across the country, and it would be not that expensive to do. Right. So it's something like this where we can move beyond the focal dyad or the ego network to a two-step or a k-step network could be quite efficient. Finally, I mean, we are sitting on a little bit of this electronic data, and that's through electronic medical records. Um, this is a, a plot I think I showed the first day where each node is a, is a physician who shared a patient in Ohio. Right? And so what's amazing about the American, American medical system is that a, a one in four sample of Medicaid patients in Ohio can generate essentially every county in the United States. Right? We had, and that's because Americans are so remarkably mobile. But understanding what this system looks like is data we have in the can. Right? So understanding what the global network of physicians are doing and whether a bad physician here is, is, is putting disease into the network somewhere else is something we should be able to do. And moreover, we now have access through the harmonization of medical records to an entire trove of these kinds of things. We can understand how nurses on shifts are connected and carrying disease from one floor to the next. We can understand the role of patients and patient advocates, of different payees and so forth, and how they're linked in a network system to pull the tools from network analysis into the healthcare directly. And I think then create a bridge between the right-hand side of this graph where we're really spending our time and energy focusing on individuals and the left-hand side where we're focusing on health systems. And that's kind of where I hope we can go in the short run. So that's what I got. Um, and I'll take questions, thoughts, comments, and concerns. Once. Please, wait, come on. I was hoping you'd let me ask the first one. I'd have a better shot at that one. Um, so I think the, the, the linking biology to social networks is, is a challenge that is, is out there. The, um, uh, and I, and I, don't I don't have a good solution to that. I honestly don't. I do, however, have a, um, have a hint, which is that there's a nice paper that um, uh, a, a crew at Columbia has done about where they put people in fMRI machines and ask them about reciprocated versus non-reciprocated ties. And it turns out there's a neurological feedback between asymmetry. And so um, uh, Roger Gould had this idea um, uh, in the late 80s that um, people, when they form social relations, have a tendency to aspire to their betters, um, but they have little patience to it. So I want to be friends with you because you're cool, but you ignore me, and so I finally get fed up and I become friends with somebody else. Right? And this, what we're seeing is there seems to be at least some kind of a neurological feedback process with, that is consistent with this notion of reciprocity. Now, how that expands out beyond what's sort of something that might essentially be you know, a pleasure censoring system, I don't know yet. Um, there's a couple of papers that have been done on the genetic side of friendship relations. So James Fowler has this paper, this famous paper showing this homophily on genetics um, uh, that was, it has to be unobserved by the respondents. My guess is most of that is probably sucked up by personality and attractiveness, which are the, 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 the extant mediators of that. But I think they're open questions. Um, on the other side, on the informatic side, I'm going to answer the first question anyway. On the informatic side, um, uh, I think that the key there is, is trying to, is the key challenge there is distinguishing real from non-real relations. And so with the, 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 the dense relations we have on Facebook or Twitter, these other kind of places, are strongly um, uh, constrained to be overwhelmingly positive. Like I don't fight with somebody on Facebook, I just ignore them. Um, and, in, and also incredibly reproductive of, of our social context. 
So it, it, we've all probably done this with our um, uh, undergraduate social networks class. If you have a, a, an undergraduate plot their ego network from Facebook, it's the kids they go to college with, the kids they work with, the kids they went to high school with. I mean, those three clusters and maybe family, if they're willing to let their grandma be friends with them, is essentially the extent of what, what these things look like. And so in that case, you haven't gained a whole lot of information about the structure of an underlying network because you're missing all those ties of people that I don't want to hang out with. Right, but that I'm willing to let post on my page because it's easier than ignoring it, right? And so that distinction between what the real friend is versus uh, individual gregariousness or something is hard to do. And I think the solutions people are getting have to do with, with, with mapping the, the, the real-time interactions on Facebook or other types of, I just use that as a placeholder, other types of social uh, media relations. Um, and I think that as kids become more, as, as young people become more um, comfortable sharing that information, it will become available to researchers in ways that it's not currently, um, but that is a, another open problem. Please. What do you think of qualitative social network analysis? I think, I think that, yeah, that's a great question. I think that qualitative social network analysis is going to be necessary to build logics of relations. So if we really want to think about what social roles, how social roles develop and what they mean, we need to understand what people make of a relationship. Right, and I think that doing that is a piece that is, um, I have this, this ongoing joke with my qualitative friends that the thing that they spend their entire life decomposing in terms of conversation, I turn into a binary coin flip of friend or not, right? And so being able to do a little bit of that kind of depth and say, well, this is an A-type friend versus an X-type friend is something that we should be able to do. And my guess is, and this is just pure speculation, I have, I have literally, a, what we get in novels or movies. But my guess is that the, the fact that we can recognize novels and movies and fiction as being realistic or not is that there's a relatively small set of these roles that, that people are willing to activate. Right? There are some types of relations that are simply not allowable. And the, the culture determines what those relations are. And because we, can, we as functioning members of society can recognize you know, a bad book from a good book is because we understand that this archetypical relationship is real and that one's not. And so my guess is that good qualitative work should be able to spell that out and that it's not going to be, it's going to be more complex than zero one, but it's not going to be as complex as we might think it would be if we just started out. Your report for a uh, community, uh, more community level study, uh, one sort of the uh, danger of doing that is that it's hard when you get to like each community becomes so unique and how do you generalize uh, beyond you Yeah, so I, I think that the, the, the question for those who couldn't hear it is that the problem with community studies or a potential problem with community studies is each one becomes this unique jewel that you describe in nice deep detail and you have no way to compare to others, right? Um, I think that's a risk, um, but it's a risk that's obviated by having multiple communities simultaneously. And so in an ideal world, what you do is you field K studies, is K being the most money you can afford, that have the same design, the same approach, that are done in different places, and you compile them together, right? That would, that would be the ideal. Right now, we're doing none of them, right? I would be happy to take uh, at least a handful of these. The, the intermediate goal, the, the intermediate solution is um, uh, a trick that, that um, Randy Hodson did. Does anybody remember, know his Dignity at Work book and, some of the, and his work for compiled um, ethnographic work? So Randy Hodson is a sociologist who used to be at Ohio State, um, who, re who re recently passed away, um, who had this wonderful project that he kept going for like 25 years where he would have graduate students at Ohio State code every work ethnography that was done in the, last, in the prior year. And so then he built up a compiled, harmonized database of all of these community studies by reading and coding the ethnographies. And so it was a meta-analysis of ethnographies that then allowed you to do a comparison, a systematic comparison, across these things that might otherwise be seen as unique specialized jewels. And so I think those kinds of features, and it takes a commitment, right? So once you do these community studies, you need to have somebody that's willing to do the harmonizing or to, or to invest in that kind of work. But I think that that's worth, work worth doing. All right, what we have left in the afternoon is um, an open lab, right? And so um, I suspect some people have uh, um, you know, planes to catch and what have you. It's really been our pleasure to host you here at Duke. Um, uh, we, we thank you for coming. Um, we're going to um, open a listserv. Um, uh, we decided it's not a good idea to share all your emails with everyone else in here, but we encourage you to talk to each other. Um, and so we're going to try to put our own networking model into practice. 
and we're going to generate a social networks and health listserv, which we would encourage you to join, but of course, you know, that's entirely voluntary. And we hope that this might spark a series of communications and um, interactions and collaborations that can continue for the next few years as you guys move forward to reshape that landscape. Thank you much.